morning, good morning everybody. You're welcome this morning. You're welcome to the house of God. You're welcome to the family of believers. You're welcome to join us this morning. Let's lift up the name of Yahweh. your throne, the earth is your footstool, your power display, no one compares to you, we all know your name, fearful are you in praise, yet in all your glory, you pour your love on me, I don't need to worry, you carry my burden, I'm called by your name, this is why I praise you.
testify to what you know. Some of us will begin to dance like we've never danced before. Despite of what we're going through, despite of how we feel, we will say, there's no measure, yeah. Oh, there's no measure. Come on, let me say. There's no measure. To your good. There's no measure. There's no measure. To your love.
praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Can you praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Did he wake you up? Let everything. Did he give you life? Come on, dance like David. Praise the Lord. Come on, dance like David. Praise the Lord. Woo! Come on, church. Show the Lord your praise. Let him see your praise this morning. Let him see your praise. Let your praise rise. It's not for me. It's not for us. It's not for you. It's for King Jesus. Come on and give him praise. Oh, yeah. 
worthy of it all. Far from you I roll, and to you I roll things. Lord, you deserve the glory. Church, can we take it again? You are worthy of it all.
clapping is not enough. Your shouting is not enough. There is no one else like him. He is so great. We are not gathered before any man. We are not gathered before any idol. We are not gathered before any deity. We are gathered before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the greatest of all. A name that is above every name. Another name, every knee bows, every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord. If you can find any God greater, if you can find anyone bigger, if you can find anyone mightier, then I can shut up. But if there is no other God like him, then I stand in the place of celebration. Celebrate him! Hallelujah. Father, we give you the glory. We stand in the place of praise and adoration. And we declare, there is no other name Amen. like yours. The name at which every knee bows and every tongue confesses. We declare this morning as we are gathered here, let sickness bow, let pain bow, let bitterness bow, and let every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to your glory. Celebrate him once more and have your seat. Hallelujah. You may have your seat. My name is Reverend Ivan Babu. So excited to welcome all of us here to Agape House New Testament Church. It's a good place to worship. It's a good place to fellowship. And it's a good place to experience the power of God. Amen. Before I go, I just want to welcome some wonderful people in our midst this morning. That's those who are here for the very first time. If today is the very first time you are worshiping with us, we are so glad you are here. Can you please stand? We want to see you. Can you please stand? Today is the first time. Oh, let's celebrate them. If they are standing by you, just give them a handshake. Just welcome them to Agape House on our behalf. God bless you so much. We are so glad you came. Please have your seats and find some time to fill the forms we have been given. We'll have a short meeting with you after close of service. And if today is the second time you are worshiping with us, we are so glad you came. Can you give us a wave? Give us a wave. Let your hand be up. The guests also need to identify you. Let your hand be up. Give us a wave. Give us a wave. Give us a wave. Give us a wave. God bless you so much for choosing Agape House the second time. Fill out those cards. We'll have a short meeting with you after a close of service. It's now time to turn our attention to the screen for Agape House News. My name is Francilian, and this is Agape House News. Get ready to be thrilled, inspired, and amazed with this latest edition of Agape House News. We are your one-stop shop for all the latest, most exciting news and happenings from our vibrant church community. This issue is jam-packed with incredible events and opportunities for growth, connection, and service to our community. We are excited to invite you to come along with us on this journey of faith, love, and service as we build a stronger and more connected Agape House family. So, let's dive in. Relationships flourish through intentional time together, open and honest conversations, and humility while continually centering on Jesus. A mother-daughter relationship is no different. The Flourish Tea is designed to nurture that special bond through gospel-centered teaching, intentional activities, and conversation prompts to help reach your daughter's heart. As you participate with your daughter in games, crafts, food, and fellowship, you will be encouraged and enabled to flourish in your relationship with Jesus and one another. Tickets are 100 CDs for adults and 70 CDs for children and are available in the courtyard. Have you connected with Agape House online? You can subscribe to our social media accounts at Agape House Ghana and receive inspirational content and event reminders. You can also visit our website at agapehouseghana.org for more information. Now, enjoy the rest of the service and have a flourishing week ahead.
words are powerful and valuable, but we treat them like they're dirt cheap. Words allow us to build up connections and start new relationships. They can cause makeups and breakups. We can all relate to this. There are moments when the right words can end up changing us, but they can also be dangerous. Used as weapons, I can murder your reputation, I can kill your vibe, or I can use them as blessings, further your elevation, positively fill your mind. Words can be used to influence others, rally a bunch of people, share opinions and unique views. Your word choice defines your voice. Words can both build and destroy, kill and bring joy, so you have to choose wisely because the power of life and death are in the words that we might speak. They say that life is too short and not to live it at a high speed, but you can shorten someone's life just by speaking unkindly. But it seems like we speak first and think last, but just know that your words are powerful, so you have to be aware of how you use them, because with great powers comes great responsibilities. Don't abuse them. Your words can change the world, depending on how you use them, positive or the opposite. Which one are you choosing? Don't take your words lightly. A man was using his printer at home one day, and he noticed that the print was coming out a bit faint. He had just changed the ink cartridge, so he knew that wasn't the problem. He decided to call his local printer repair shop. He spoke on the phone to a friendly employee, told him about the challenge he was facing, and the employee said, well, it just sounds like your printer needs to be cleaned. And then he said something that surprised the man. He said, you know what, I'll tell you a secret. The cleaning's kind of expensive, we charge 500 CDs, but maybe you could just get out your printer manual and read about how to clean it yourself. The man was pleasantly surprised that the employee was giving him this tip and offering to help him save money, but he was also confused as to why he was discouraging business. So he asked the employee, does your boss know that you tell customers to clean it themselves? And the man said, well, actually, it's my boss's idea. You see, we usually make more money on repairs if people try to fix it themselves first. <laughs> tell your neighbor, fix it. The good news for us this morning is that God does not leave us to fix things on our own, and he doesn't charge us for fixing it. Amen. Last week, we started a sermon series at Agape House called Fix It. 2024 is our year to flourish, and this series is an opportunity for us to look at different areas of our lives and see if there's anything that might be keeping us from flourishing. Where do we need to change or fix it so that we can enjoy all that God has in store for us in this year. Last week, Pastor Divine led us to look at fixing our prayer, and this week we want to look at our words. So I want to ask you a question this morning. If you consider your life, your relationships, your work, your home, is there any area that you are not happy with, any area that's not flourishing? any area where things just don't seem to be working, could it be as a result of the words you're speaking? Is there any area of your life where you feel stuck or stagnant? Any area where you're experiencing disappointment or hopelessness? Could it be changed by changing how you speak? This week, I read the story of a lady named Pamela Wilde. Pamela was a nurse, a wife, and a mother. One day, she got a pain in her neck, and she thought, I've just pulled a muscle. So she put some ice on it, went for a massage, but it kept getting worse. And within about two weeks of first feeling that pain, Pamela was in debilitating pain whenever she tried to talk, move her arms, or even stand up. Doctors thought maybe she had a tear in her neck muscle, but they ran tests. They couldn't find anything. For the next eight years, Pamela spent almost all her time in one room, lying down on a bed as her health grew worse and worse. She had severe pain in her gallbladder. She developed pancreatitis. She lost weight. She had heart palpitations and severe food allergies that she'd never had before. No doctor was able to determine what caused such a wide array of symptoms. But after years of research and with trial and error for different treatments, Pamela discovered the source of all her sickness was a hidden tooth infection. 
She'd previously had four root canals, and in those, those sites had since gotten infected and were releasing toxins into her body. She went for surgery to clean her teeth, and within hours of the surgery, her heart palpitations stopped. Within a week, she was able to cook food for herself, and in time, she made a full recovery. She had a physical problem in the mouth, but it affected all parts of her body. And in the same way, a spiritual problem with our words can have a negative effect on all areas of our lives. Some of the problems you are facing are because of the words you are saying or not saying. And maybe you've changed the time that you pray. Maybe you've changed the church that you go to. You've changed so many things in your life trying to fix what you're struggling with, but you haven't address the problem with your words. But this morning, God wants to help you fix it. So let's bow our heads and invite his presence right now. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege to be in your presence this morning. It's a holy and an awesome place, and we know that you're here with us. Father, our prayer to you this morning is that you would open up our hearts to your word and help us to hear your voice speaking to us. Show us in our lives the words we are speaking, those that are not pleasing to you, those that you want us to speak, and give us the grace, Lord, to take your word, to put it into practice, and to fix it so that we can flourish for your glory. We pray that you receive all the glory from our time together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Inside your bulletin are your sermon notes. You can get them out as we discover three steps to fix your words. And the first step we want to look at this morning is you need to remember God's purpose for your words. The gift of words, the power to speak comes from God, and it was established by him for a purpose. We see this purpose from the very beginning of the Bible, the third verse of the Bible, Genesis 1-3, it says, and God said, and then as you continue reading that chapter, you see God speaking his words into nothingness, and with his words, he creates life. He establishes order. He puts everything in its place. He blesses and establishes purpose for mankind. So our first introduction to words in the Bible is that they are extremely powerful and that they are used to accomplish something good. And God does not keep this ability to speak to himself. He created us in his image, and he gave us the same ability to speak so that we would use our words to continue God's work of creating life, establishing order, blessing, and building others up. This is God's purpose for our words. They are a gift we can use to shape our lives, to shape our nation, our family, and our church. Our words are meant to bring solutions where there's problems. Our words are meant to bring blessing to our lives and others. Our words are to build others up in love, to give hope to the hopeless, to correct those who are wrong. When Jesus came, we see that he perfectly modeled how we should use our words. 1 Peter 2 verse 22 says, He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Isaiah 61 verse 1 talks about how Jesus preached the good news, comforted the brokenhearted, proclaimed freedom to the captives. And in John 6, 68, Jesus' disciples said to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus used his words to heal, to teach, to guide, to love, to bring life. Throughout history, we see people tapping into the power of words, sometimes for good purposes, sometimes for bad. We see people like Nelson Mandela, Kwame Nkrumah, they use the power of words to inspire others, to create unity, and to bring freedom. But people like Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, they also understood the power of words, but they used them to oppress and enslave people. How are you using your words? Do the words you speak every day line up with the purpose for which God gave them to you? Words are a gift. They are a responsibility. If we are honest, most of us have one or of two issues with our words. The first is that some people are speaking what the Bible calls words of death. You know what they are, but I'll just mention a few this morning. Words that are argumentative, complaining, grumbling, lying, speaking ill about our leaders, it's in the Bible, cursing others, gossiping, foolish joking, 
blaspheming. And God has good reason for warning us about these kinds of words. They will keep you from flourishing. And God loves us too much to leave us with this kind of problem in our life. You see, when we speak words like this, they are directly opposed to the purpose for which God gave you words. Instead of creating life, they bring death. Instead of establishing order, they bring chaos. Instead of blessing, they tear and they hurt. My son is four years old, and lately when I remind him of something that he's supposed to do, he responds with, I already know this. Why are you reminding me? And I think sometimes when we come to church, we hear things that we've been hearing since we were much younger, and we think, okay, I already know this. But sometimes what we know and what we do don't match up. It's easy to slip into speaking words of death because That's the language of the world around us. It's what we hear when we engage with the world every day, constantly putting down others, constant mocking, constant negativity, constant cursing, lying, criticism. And though we may agree that these types of words are wrong, oftentimes our speech just becomes casual. We think it's just something I said. But once you speak those words, do you realize that you've released them into your life to create consequences, and to shape your experiences. When's the last time you sat down and really thought about what you say every day? Because words don't disappear. Each word is a seed you plant into your future. And there are some strongholds that are waiting to gain a foothold in your life through your mouth. And over and over again, the scripture warns us we have the power to destroy ourselves and others if we are not careful with what we say. Psalm 34, 12 to 13, whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, in other words, if you want to flourish, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Psalm 13, verse 3, Those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. Proverbs 21, verse 23, he who guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from distress. Do you realize that our wrong words can even keep us trapped in a cycle in our lives? That's what happened to the Israelites. When we read about the Israelites in the wilderness, one of the big problems they had were they spoke words that were continually grumbling, complaining, speaking against God, words of negativity and disbelief instead of faith. And they were stuck in this cycle in the wilderness of facing challenges, complaining, being judged, facing challenges, complaining, being judged, until they outgrew and they became mature and they developed faith to say that we will not speak against the Lord before they could now enter the promised land. They could not take the way of speaking that was bringing death into that new land God had promised them. And today, as you remember God's purpose for your words, the Holy Spirit may be highlighting a way you've been speaking that is keeping you from flourishing, keeping you from your next season, keeping you from a new level. God wants you to realign with his purpose for your words. But this is just one part of the problem. There's another part. Because we can run through this list of, you know, bad words, and we think, I don't have a problem with any of those. But that doesn't necessarily mean your words are right. Because fixing our words is not just about what to not say. It's also about what we ought to say. The wrong words are a problem. But the absence of right words are also a problem. There are words of death and there are words of life. We are called to speak life. The Bible says we should give or minister grace to others through our words. We are to encourage one another and build each other up. We are to witness for Christ with our words. We are to love, strengthen, heal, uphold justice and righteousness and bless. These are words of life This is what God has called us to, and our world is hungry for words like this. There was an old lady named Mammy Adams who would always go to the same post office in her town because the employees there were very friendly. One year, she went close to Christmas time to buy some stamps, but the line was very long. She took her place in the line and was waiting for her turn to buy stamps. And someone saw this old lady standing in a long line. They felt compassion for her. So they went up to her and said, you know, you don't have to stand in this long line. There's a machine now that you can use to buy your stamps. Just put your money in and the machine will give you your stamps. 
And she said, oh, I know about the machine, but the machine won't ask me, how are you today? You're looking lovely. Our world is hungry. Simple words of care and encouragement often mean more than we realize. For some of us, there are situations going on around us that need life-giving speech. There are people who look up to us and they desperately need a word of guidance or encouragement. Sometimes we are silent. We have families who need our words of love and blessing. Parents, your children need to hear you speak into them. Life, hope, future. When the great painter Benjamin West was a young boy, he decided to draw a picture of his sister. So he got out bottles of ink and he succeeded in making a big mess. But when his mother got home and saw what he did, she said, what a beautiful picture. And she kissed him. And many years later, Benjamin West said, that made me a painter. And he did indeed go on to become a great painter and president of the Royal Academy. And we interact with many people who need to hear a good word, a timely word, a godly word. One day, a teacher asked her students to get out a piece of paper and on the piece of paper to write down the name of everyone else in their class, to leave a space in between. The students did that, and the teacher said, now I want you to go back and next to every name, I want you to write down the kindest thing you can think about that person. So the students did that, and they handed it in to the teacher. That weekend, the teacher took those pieces of paper and she took all the kind things that had been said about one student, put it on a paper for every student, listed all the kind things that had been said about them. When the kids came into the class on Monday, she passed the papers back out to them and she could see the joy in their faces. Wow, I didn't know someone thought that of me. Who said that? It's so kind. But after that, nobody ever mentioned the papers again. She forgot about it. Many years later, one of the boys in that class was killed in combat, and she went to the funeral. When his parents saw the teacher, they called her aside and said, we want to show you something. This was found in our son's pocket when he was taken off the battlefield. And they pulled out a piece of paper that by now was very worn. It had been taped together several times. And the teacher, with tears in her eyes, saw that it was that paper where all his classmates had written down kind words. The parents said he kept it with him wherever he went. It meant the world to him. Some other classmates who were at that funeral came forward, and each one of them testified, I still have my paper. One of them said, I read it every morning. Another one said, I've put it in my wedding album next to my wedding pictures. Another one said, it's here in my pocket. I take it everywhere I go. The power of a kind word to impact others. And God has placed in us this ability to bring life, to establish order, to bless and to build up. But if we are doing nothing with it, there are consequences for that too. You see, if you fail to speak into places where God has given you influence, someone else will. Are some of the problems in our society because Christians are silent. You see, the one who's speaking is the one who's shaping. And if we leave the speaking always to people who don't know God, don't have his spirit, don't have morals, don't have integrity, they are the ones shaping the situations around us. And we wonder why things are a mess. But not only that, if you fail to speak with purpose, you're missing out on much of what God wants you to enjoy. Proverbs 13 verse 2 says, from the fruit of his lips, a man enjoys good things. Proverbs 16 24 says, gracious words are like honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the body. Proverbs 15 verse 23 says, a person finds joy in giving an apt reply. How good is a timely word. Words are a gift from God. To speak words of death is to abuse the gift. To not speak life is to waste it. And most of us here have one of these two problems with our words. Maybe you have something you need to stop saying. Maybe you have something you need to start saying. Maybe you have both. But either one of these problems is too serious to ignore. Your destiny and other people's destiny are connected to your words. About 10 years ago, I left my house and I was driving to church. When I got about a minute from my house, I saw a young man walking on the side of the road. 
And I knew him as my younger brother's friend. I didn't know him really personally, but I knew that he hung out with my younger brother and they were friends. So I pulled over. I said, hi, where are you going? He said, I'm going to a and C. I I said, oh, great. I'm going to church. Get in. I'll give you a ride. It was just a, a kind act I was doing for my brother's friend. And the ride was about 10 minutes. And in those 10 minutes, we chatted about different things. But I'll be honest, I wasn't really interested in talking to him because he's not my friend. He's my younger brother's friend. And I was busy thinking about all the things I need to do next. So I dropped him off, and I didn't think any more about it. And exactly a week to the day, I got a call from my mom with the tragic news that this young man had committed suicide. And I thought about the fact that he sat in my car And I don't know if anything I could have said to him that day would have made a difference in the challenges that he was going through. But I thought about the fact that so many times we have an opportunity and we're just talking, but we're not speaking life. And we never know what people are going through. You don't know what the person you buy from every week is going through. You don't know what the person sitting next to you in the office is going through. Sometimes you don't even know what your spouse is going through. You don't know how much they need your words. Friends, we are already speaking every day. Is there anyone here who doesn't speak? Okay, we are all speaking every day. The same energy, the same effort it takes to say the wrong words It's the same energy and effort it takes to say the right words. Why not use our words in a way that leads to blessing and life instead of destroying, bringing judgment, idle talk? We need to remember God's purpose for our words so that we can be corrected and encouraged. And if we want to see change, if we want to align our lips and our words with God's purposes, then we need to take the second step, and that's check the source. Put your hand on your heart and say, check the source. So how do I fix my words? How can I stop speaking words of death? How can I start speaking words of life? For many people, the solution is, well, I just need to control my tongue. It's just something I need to try harder with what I say. But unfortunately, that is impossible. No matter how much we try, we cannot control what we say. The Bible says in James 3, verse 8 to 11, no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? And this scripture makes it clear that even though we cannot take total control over our tongue, like a spring of water, there's a source that the tongue is drawing from. And that source is the heart. For Matthew 15 verse 18 tells us, the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. So my heart is the source of everything I say. The attitudes and beliefs in my heart affect my words. And if I want to speak life, if I want to align with God's purpose for my words, there are two key beliefs that we need to hold in our heart to influence our tongue. The first is the fear of the Lord. Tell your neighbor, fear the Lord. You know, if you read the book of Proverbs, we see the wise man is held up as a standard for how to speak. The wise speak gracious words, the lips of the wise spread knowledge. Over and over again, Proverbs tells us the wise person speaks well. But listen to Proverbs 9 verse 10. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Because wisdom and how we use our words is not something you can study to acquire. It's not a level of self-discipline you can attain. Wisdom in how we use our words is simply the natural outflow of a heart that fears the Lord, reverences him, and honors his lordship. Because to flourish in our lives, we need holy lips, and we need life-giving lips. And both are only possible when Jesus is the Lord of your heart. You cannot separate your Christian life and your relationship with God from the words that you speak. We see from the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, he has this vision of God seated on his throne in all his glory and his magnificence. And when he sees God, he begins to fear. He begins to tremble. And the first thing that comes to mind is, I am a man of un 
clean lips. Because when the fear of God comes on our life, we realize what's wrong in how we are speaking. And Isaiah saw an angel take a coal, bring it to his lips. And he said, your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. When the Lord is truly reverenced in our hearts, we cannot speak carelessly, hopelessly, maliciously, lightly. A young man named John received a parrot as a gift. Now, unfortunately, the parrot had a bad attitude and an even worse vocabulary. Every word out of the parrot's mouth, parrot's mouth was rude, obnoxious, and laced with profanity. John tried as hard as he could to change the way the parrot spoke. He was constantly saying polite words to the parrot. He was playing soft music, trying to clean up his vocabulary. But the parrot kept getting ruder and ruder and ruder. And finally, John was so fed up one day that he yelled at the parrot. The parrot yelled back. He shook the parrot. The parrot started cursing at him. And in desperation, he opened up the freezer, dropped the parrot inside, and closed the lid. And he heard cursing and screaming and insults for a few minutes. And then all of a sudden, it was quiet. For a whole minute, there was not a peep. And now John is worried that he's hurt his parrot. So he opens the freezer. He pulls the parrot out. The parrot comes out calmly. He says, I believe I may have offended you with my rude language and actions. I'm sincerely remorseful for my inappropriate transgressions. And I vow that I will do everything I can to correct my speech. John was shocked. I mean, what made such a change in the bird's attitude? He was about to ask, but then the parrot continued, and he said, may I please ask what the chicken in the freezer did? (laughs) Because fear, respect, reverence changes the way we speak. And God is listening to every word. He will one day ask us to give an account for every word we've spoken. Matthew 12, verse 36, on the day of judgment, you will give an account for every empty word you've spoken. And we have to understand that he is our father, but he is also the judge. In January of this year, a man named Diobra Redden was standing in a Las Vegas court. He had been convicted of attempted battery, and he was standing there waiting for the judge to read his sentence. Suddenly, Diobra Redden jumped across the room onto the judge's bench, grabbed the judge, slammed her head against the wall, and pulled some of her hair out before he was subdued. Now, the incredible thing to me about this story is, why, why? Why would you attack the judge? This is the person who's going to determine how many years you go to prison. This is the person who's going to determine how big of a fine you have to pay. Of all the people in the room that day, why would you attack the judge? But when it comes to our judge, we can even use his name in vain. We joke about the things that he hates, We tear down the people that he loves. And we need the prayer of Psalm 141, verse 3. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Because in the absence of the fear of the Lord, we will speak whatever is right in our own eyes, but his fear checks our tongue. And if I truly believe that God is sovereign and I truly believe he's in control of every area of my life, then when I speak, I am not responding to the situation. I am responding to God. Let me say it again. If I believe that God's in control, when I speak, I'm not responding to the situation because the situation's not in control. I'm responding to God. This is why the Bible says of the Israelites that they spoke against the Lord. So when I'm angry, When I'm tired, when my kids are in their 100th fight of the day, when my spouse disappoints me, when that business meeting starts getting shady, when that colleague is undermining you, and when the ECG goes off again, (laughs) fear the Lord, and you will find wisdom to use your words to speak life, to bring order, to encourage, to correct, and to bless. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We need to check the source. Do we fear the Lord? We need to renew our reverence for him. And secondly, we need to have 
faith in the Lord. Tell your neighbor, have faith. You see, we need the fear of the Lord to check our tongues, but we need faith in the Lord to fuel our words because faith is the catalyst for words of life. You see, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13 says, it is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, church, read this with me, we also believe and therefore speak. We believe that God is with us. We believe in his love. We believe he has won the victory. We believe we are more than conquerors. We believe he can redeem and restore any situation. We believe that he's for us, for our marriages, for our children, for our families, for our church, and for our electricity. Hallelujah. We believe that he's working all things for our good. We believe that nothing can separate us from his love. And Paul summarizes all all these truths in Romans chapter 8 and when he gets to verse 31 this is what he says what then shall we say in response to these things if God is for us who can be against us because in light of all that God is and all he has done for us we must surely say something faith always speaks the knowledge of God's love power and victory gives us the courage to speak hope, to speak faith, to speak joy and life into every situation. Friends, I love the Apostle Paul. None of us here have gone through more than Paul has gone through. And in a side to all the times that he was tried to be killed by various people, there was a a stretch of his life towards the end of the book of Acts that was particularly trying. He was arrested in Jerusalem, falsely accused of a crime he didn't commit, put in prison, and then um, there was a plot against his life, so he had to move prisons in the middle of the night. He was denied justice. His court case kept getting postponed for about two years, and after going through all these various tracks, Then he's put on a boat to go to Rome. And of course, when he gets on the boat, the boat sinks. I mean, one thing after another. Maybe you feel like that's been happening in your life lately. But that wasn't all. He survived the shipwreck, thank God. He gets to an island. He starts to build a fire. And when he puts wood on the fire, a snake comes out of the fire and bites him. If it was us, what would we have said? God, are you kidding me? (laughs) Like, seriously, you know, what's going on here? But I love Paul, because the Bible says Paul didn't say anything. Paul just shook the snake off into the fire, and he suffered no ill effects. He didn't give a temporary situation a permanent impact through his words. You see, the snake didn't hurt Paul, but something he said could have, but he didn't even speak Faith doesn't minimize the very real hardships and trials we pass through, but it frames it in a greater context of what God is doing through those trials. We don't deny the reality, but we are focused on the greater truth, the greater reality. That's why 2 Corinthians 4, 8 to 9 says, we are hard pressed on every side. Yes, I can acknowledge it. It's okay to talk about it. Things are difficult, but let me add this. We are not crushed. Yes, we are perplexed, but let me add this. We are not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. Yes, we are struck down, but we are not destroyed. So when the economy is terrible, when sickness keeps coming back, when the depression won't lift, we need to hold on to faith and let it fuel our words, not our circumstances. Faith motivates us to speak. If we believe, we speak. Faith motivates us to speak into the lives of people around us. If we believe that God loves them and God has a purpose for them, we will speak into them. Faith is what motivates Alex Jimenez, an entrepreneur in Cape Town, to wake up every morning and prepare sandwiches. But these are no ordinary sandwiches. On every sandwich, he writes a word of life. Don't feel alone. God is with you. You are very important. Smile. God will never leave you. And he writes these words out of faith. Faith that the homeless people in his city are people God loves. And he's encouraging them, speaking life into them. And then he goes out in the morning and gives it to the people on the streets. Faith speaks life. Faith speaks over our nation. Friends, Everybody's cursing ECG. Is it a wonder they're having any problems? Who is blessing them? 
We need to open our mouth and say, I bless ECG. I bless the employees from the top to the bottom. I bless the call center representatives. You've got to bless them. Speak life into them. Faith speaks over our families. Faith leads us to pray, to preach, to teach, to reach with our words. And God wants us to renew our faith today. So to fix our words, we need to remember God's purpose for our words. Then we need to check the source of our words. Am I living in the fear of the Lord? Am I walking by faith? When you do this, you're ready to take the third step. Learn to listen. Everyone say, learn to listen. Isaiah 50, 4 to 5 says, The sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning. He wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. From this scripture, we see a life-giving tongue is a disciplined tongue. It's a tongue that listens to and receives instruction. One of the ways we will be able to speak life to others is when we learn to listen before we speak. In other words, we need to practice the pause. Everyone say, practice the pause. See, James 1 verse 19 says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Quick to listen, quick to listen to who? Quick to listen to other people, sure, but I believe quick to listen to the Holy Spirit and then slow to speak. Proverbs 15 verse 28 says, the heart of the righteous weighs its answers. Picture that with me. Picture a scale and every word you say, before you say it, you put it on the scale and you weigh it. Is it too much? Is it too little? Is it what I should say? The heart of the righteous weighs its answers, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. And evil here doesn't just mean moral evil. It also means harm, disaster, calamity. In 2012, a truck driver in Poland forgot to close the back door of his cargo truck. He was carrying sardines. As he started driving, the door flew open and out poured 23 tons of sardines. That would take a lot of kinky and shih tzu, right? It created a huge mess caused delays for other people, and the driver had to pay 5,000 euros for the cleanup costs. So are we like this driver? Do we open up our mouth and gush our words out and create problems, or do we weigh them? Are we slow to speak? When we practice the pause, pausing before we speak, then we leave room to depend on the Holy Spirit and to listen for direction. Nehemiah 2, verse 4 to 5, this is what Nehemiah did. The king said to Nehemiah, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven. There was a pause. He waited. And in that pause, the Holy Spirit gave him the right words for his request. Acts 3, verse 4, Peter and John were going to the temple. The lame man said to them, give me some money, some silver and gold. And then the Bible says Peter and John looked at him intently. Can you see there was a pause? They waited. They watched him. And in that pause, the Holy Spirit showed them he has the faith to be healed. And a miracle took place. Proverbs 16, verse 1 said, to humans belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. We won't always know what to say. We won't always know the words that will give life and bring freedom. And that's why we must learn to listen first. One of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to teach us what we do not know. That's what John 14, 26 says. Uh, a few years ago, myself and a group of friends had an, a Sunday morning outreach. We would wake up around 3.30 or 4, and we would go to um, Lagos Avenue and some of the surrounding streets because we saw that there were a number of people who would come to the club on Saturday night, and at dawn on Sunday morning, they would still be there, usually very drunk, some of them sober, and we took that opportunity to witness to them, tell them about Christ, and invite them to church. So we were there one Sunday, 3.30 in the morning, pitched black. We got there, we were praying and organizing ourselves to start talking to the people. And all of a sudden, a man comes up to us, very aggressive, very argumentative. What are you doing here? Who gave you permission to be on the street? These are my streets. I'm the leader of the gang who runs this area. If I blow my whistle now, I have men all around who will come and attack you. You have to tell me, what are you doing here? 
It was confrontational. You could see the anger in him. We all start looking at each other like, okay, who's going to answer this? <laughs> and I was really feeling led, you know, that my brothers in Christ should answer it. So I'm kind of backing away from the situation like maybe I should leave. And they start a conversation and it's not going well. I mean, you can see that the guy is not calming down and whatever was being said to him, it was just stirring him up and provoking him. And I'm standing there and I'm praying and I'm thinking, how are we gonna get out of this situation? And all of a sudden I feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit, ask him when his birthday is. And I'm like, oh no, God, you don't understand. <laughs> this is not the kind of situation where you talk about birthdays, but it kept coming. When is his birthday? When is his birthday? When is his birthday? So finally, I just kind of shouted to interrupt the conversation. Like, I just have a question. When is your birthday? And instantly, the anger left. The aggression left. You could see this amazing change come over him. And he was shocked. And he looked at me and he said, how did you know today is my birthday? And we said, can we pray for you for your birthday? And he said, yes. We minister to him because the Holy Spirit knows the words of life and spirit-led words make deep impact. We don't want to speak from head knowledge, but we want to speak life. We need open ears. The scripture says he awakens our ears morning by morning. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit, but we also need to listen to the word of God. You see, when we continually listen to God's word and it's stored up inside of us, that's the material that the Holy Spirit will use to show us what we should say. Luke 6 verse 45 says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Are you full of his word? Friends, from January till now, have you even memorized one scripture. We need his word in our hearts so it can come out of our mouths and be a blessing to people. You know, if somebody comes to you and says, I'm going through a hard time, it's good to say, oh, you're going to be fine. You know, you're, you're a great person and you're going to make it through. That can be encouraging, but it's better to use scripture and to say, you know what? Psalm 34 verse 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And I'm prophesying over you that in this time of hardship, the Lord is closer to you than ever before. If your child comes to you and you want to bless your child, it's good to say, you know, you're so beautiful. You're so smart. You're a great person. I love your personality, but it's better to say, you know, may the Lord hear you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from his sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. It's better to bless with the word of God than with our own human words. One of the reasons for that is when we speak, neuroscientists have discovered when someone is speaking, like I'm speaking to you, and you're hearing what I'm saying and you're understanding it, if you could measure our brain activity right now, you would see that our brain waves are synchronized. When we came in, maybe your brain waves were all over here and mine were all over here. But as we start communicating with words, and you're understanding what I'm saying, our brainwaves are synchronized. Now this matters because Jesus was God in human form. So it means when Jesus spoke the words that we have written down in our Bible, when he spoke them and his disciples understood them, their brains began moving in the same pattern as Jesus. That's why the Bible says we have the mind of Christ. Because when we understand his word, our mind becomes aligned with the mind of Christ, with the mind of God. So when you speak not just positive words, but when you speak the word of God into others, you are actually helping them align their mind with the mind of God. Isn't that profound? We need to listen to the Holy Spirit. We need to be full of the word of God. There's a lady I admire so much. Her name is Sally Clarkson. Her and her husband have a ministry to families, they do conferences, and they speak all over the world. She shares a story of when she was going through a very difficult personal time. Her husband uh, had been injured and not been able to do much work for some time. One of her kids was sick and every night was up late into the night because they were having chronic asthma. She had a book deadline and she was under so much pressure to finish her book because they really needed the money from the book deal for their family. And she got up one morning after having just a few hours of sleep and she was overcome by this heavy cloud of depression she thought, how can I possibly get up and go through today? But Sally was full of the word of God. She loves her Bible and she knows how to listen to the Holy Spirit. And as she was lying there feeling so discouraged, she heard that prompting, your husband needs encouragement. 
your husband needs encouragement. So even though she didn't feel like it, she got up, she put her hand on her husband's shoulder and she began to speak over him. Even though you're in so much pain, I admire how patient you are. You're a great example to me and the children. We appreciate you. And he began crying. He said, I was lying here thinking, is my life even worthwhile anymore? They encouraged each other. They prayed together. But the most amazing part of the story for me is what happened next. She got up and opened her door. And there outside her door was one of her sons. She said, what are you doing here? He said, oh, I had a bad dream, but I knew you were tired. I didn't want to wake you up, so I decided to sleep outside your door. And then he said, Mom, I heard what you said to Dad this morning. I want a marriage like that when I grow up. You never know who's listening to you. You never know that in encouraging one person, you're giving vision to another. But when you listen to the Holy Spirit and you speak the words that he gives you, you will bring life, 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 and life. And the world doesn't need our money, our resources, or our talents as much as it needs our spirit-filled words of life. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you so much this morning that you've given us the gift of words. Lord, it's a privilege to be able to speak as you spoke, Lord, and to use our words to bring order, to bring life, and to bring hope. And Father, this morning we bring our mouths before you, and we pray that you would touch our lips like you touched Isaiah's lips, and you would sanctify us and cleanse us from the wrong words we've been speaking. And we pray you would touch our hearts and put inside of us the fear of the Lord and faith, Lord, in every situation. And we pray also this morning, Lord, over our ears, that you would open our ears to listen and to learn to know your voice so that we will pause and we will hear the life-giving words and we will pass them on to our homes, to our children, in our workplace, and in our nation. Fill us this morning, Lord, with words of life so that when we go out from here, we will bring your life and your love everywhere we go. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Come on, everybody, stand to your feet. Let's put this message into practice by singing out words of life, by saying yes, Lord, to your will, to your words, to your desire for our mouth. Oh, yes, we say I'm trading my sorrows.
give it down to the Lord. Yes. His words are yea and amen. One that you may have your seat. God bless you so much, Pastor Sarah, for such a wonderful way. Amen. We've read about words. The world needs our words. The lost world, the lost world those who have not been saved, they want to hear something from us. But these words, at times, can only be spoken through our giving. And anytime you give to the kingdom of God, you are speaking some words, saying that Jesus loves the world and he wants them to come to the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the time to send those words through your giving. As you can see on the screen, we have our online giving platforms. We have a POS system outside of the auditorium. You also have the red and white envelope in your bulletin that you can give through. If you've made some pledges in the past and they are here, feel free to drop them in the basket. God bless you as you give. If you want to clap, do it better unto the Lord. Amen. Let's, let's bow down our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you because you have given us the opportunity to give to the kingdom. Everything we have, first of all, came from you. And we thank you that you have given us the opportunity 
and the heart to give. One thing we pray for is, Father, help our heart of giving. That any time we have an opportunity like this, we will not hesitate in giving to your kingdom. Because it is in this that we will also be blessed. Bless your kingdom with these seeds. Multiply them, increase them, and let many souls be affected and influenced by this. We bless you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we rise as we bring this service to a close? It's been a wonderful time. Amen. Yeah, we have heard the word of God, and we are going to be challenged. Amen. Your words will be challenged. If you are a parent here and have your kids that are gappy kids, this is the time to quietly file out and pick them. Let's clap for them as they do so. Yeah. It's not easy like that. Amen. If today is the first time you are worshiping with us, as we promised, we want to have a short reception with you. Can you please come for it? Come with your belongings. Let's clap for them as they do so. Today is the first time you are worshiping at Agape House. We want to have a short reception with you. Please kindly come forward and move this way. They are coming in their numbers. God bless you so much. God bless you so much. We are so happy you chose Agape House. Please come forward. Don't be shy. Please come forward. Oh, they are coming in their numbers. They are coming in their numbers. God bless you so much. We have a short reception with you. We want to get to know about you as you also get to know about Agape House. And if today is the second time you are worshiping with us, also come forward. Let's clap for them out there. Today is the second time. Today is the second time. You have been here once and you are here again today. Oh, let's appreciate them. Let's appreciate them. Let's appreciate them. God bless you. When we close, uh, pastors will be stationed here to pray for you. If you need uh, a personal prayer, you have issues with your words, you want them to anoint your words for you, anoint your lips for you, please come forward. Amen. Or if it is not you, but maybe the person standing to your left or your right that you know you are going home with. But you, know, you want those words to be anointed. Feel free. Come with the person, okay? I'm not saying you should come with her. I said come with the person. Because it can be both ways. Amen. Clap for Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Father, we thank you for today. And we are happy. We are so blessed by your word. May your word influence our words. May your word be imprinted on our hearts. No matter how difficult the situation is, let our words be seasoned with salt. We bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's share in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Surely, His goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Have a wonderful week. Say
Let your 